and welcome back to the Urology Care Podcast, the official podcast of the Urology Care Foundation. Did you know urologic cancers affect the organs and structures of the male and female urinary system and the male reproductive system, and that common types of urologic cancers are bladder cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, and testicular cancer, just to name a few? With that in mind, the goal of this podcast is to give support and guidance to urologic cancer patients, their loved ones, and their friends. We hope this podcast will help people know more about the psychosocial and emotional impact of a urologic cancer and review tips to help with the well-being and care of both patients and caregivers. We will strive to help patients, caregivers, and their healthcare team be able to better talk through many topics around urologic cancers. Welcome, Dr. Scarpato and Dr. Galtz to the Urology Care Podcast. We're so excited to have you on today to talk about living with a urologic cancer. Um, so can you please start by telling us a little bit about yourselves and a little more about your work? And Dr. Scarpato, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks so much. My name is Kristen Scarpato. I am a urologic oncologist at Vanderbilt. I came down to Nashville, Tennessee from Massachusetts to do my fellowship in urologic oncology, and I have never left. I'm considering myself to be a bit of a Southern girl now. Um, my primary clinical practice focuses on bladder and prostate cancer. I treat a lot of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and a lot of prostate cancer kind of throughout the continuum, including advanced prostate cancer. And my other hat is in education. I'm the residency program director here, which has been awesome and really rewarding and love working with the residents and also the vice chair of education for our department. And I love education for trainees, but also for our patients. And I've been involved in many different patient care opportunities as they come up, including the Urology Care Foundation, the Bladder Cancer Advocacy uh, Network, and is just local patient outreach, which we do a lot of at Vanderbilt. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Heather Honoré Goltz. I am a professor of social work at the University of Houston downtown. I've been in this fight uh, in the practice and the study of bladder cancer since about 2008. That was the, the time point in which I started my postdoc in health services research and development with the VA. And my grandmother, who uh, raised me, uh, actually was diagnosed that same year uh, that I started my postdoc. And so it was just, um, you know, almost this uh, magical, you know, sad, but confluence of events that kind of led me, it took me out of the genetics realm where I was inhabiting with my research and uh, took me into bladder cancer. And so I've worked as a clinical social worker um, as part of a team uh, with bladder cancer patients, their families, and caregivers over the years. I'm also a bladder cancer researcher. Um, I study aspects of survivorship, all the way from health literacy to symptom management, distress screening, and developing interventions for patients, caregivers, and spouses. I know cancer on a personal level, uh, not just my grandmother being diagnosed with uh, bladder cancer at the, really the launch of my own career as a clinician and scientist, uh, but my family has been on its own cancer journey with bladder cancer, prostate, and other forms of uh, cancer, including uh, thyroid, parathyroid, lung, and uh, colorectal, and so on. So I'm I'm so happy to be here and uh, just ready and, and excited to talk with us and, and with you all about the caregiver journey. Thank you both for sharing just a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. So let's start by talking about the urologic cancer journey to include some of the stages people may go through and how they may best walk through this journey together. Dr. Scarpato? The cancer word, the C word is a very scary word. And I think once patients hear this word, it can almost end the rest of the conversation. And so while the doctor 
may be talking about the various clinical stages, the patient has kind of shut down and had a hard time kind of listening to all the, the clinical jargon because along with clinical stages, there are stages of grief and acceptance and shock. And, um, you know, I think we have to think about both of them being complete physicians. You of course have to know about a disease state. Patients may present with clinically localized disease, meaning that it is just in the prostate or just in the bladder and hasn't spread to other parts of the body but they may progress through various stages, low grade, intermediate grade, high grade. Um, and while that's happening, there are many other aspects psychologically that um, are occurring and are uh, just as important, I would argue. And so I think as we're going through the stages of learning that you have a diagnosis that can be really scary and learning about all of the different interventions, which may be more invasive, less invasive, but can really impact quality of life and can impact survivorship, which is a word that we hear so much of now, fortunately, in cancer. Um, it's helpful, as um, you you said in your, your question there, how may, how may they get through this together? So I really think it's so important for patients to bring someone with them to their appointments, whether it's a spouse, a child, a family member, or a friend, someone from church, someone from work, somebody who can help be there to listen to the um, information that's given, provide support, and um, just be another person that participates in, in the patient journey, which does have many different stages, many ups and downs. I do think that clinicians can also benefit patients by providing written materials, which can be taken home and kind of digested after the meeting where it can be hard to kind of digest all of that information at once. So any sort of support system is really important. And there are support groups available. Previously, I had mentioned the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, um, Beacon, but many uh, family and friends or local hospital-based support groups can be uh, really instrumental in, in the journey through cancer, whatever type of cancer it is, um, because there is a lot of fear and worry that comes along with that. And fortunately, we have people like Dr. Golse and people who uh, are invested in understanding a little bit more about the, the psychological journey that occurs. Dr. Golse, can you share your thoughts as well? Uh, absolutely. And um, if, boy, what a lead in. Um, thank you. When my grandmother was first diagnosed with bladder cancer, she was actually in her early 70s. And so she would consulted with her primary care physician. Uh, she was experiencing, uh, you know, some urinary incontinence, stress incontinence. Um, and so it was natural with her age uh, to go to her primary care physician who then sent her to her gynecologist. And, and, the, and at first the information she received what, and what we received from her and her team was that as an older woman, the, the symptoms she was experiencing were deemed postmenopausal symptoms. And because it, it looked, you know, if you think about it, uh, as kind of a normal part of aging. Um, but obviously, um, things kind of worsened over time and it became clear this wasn't a normal part of aging for a very active, healthy, uh, woman, um, even in her early seventies. Uh, my grandmother was extremely healthy and extremely physically and mentally active. Um, so at first, it can be frustrating for patients and caregivers when you're looking for answers and you're getting, you know, mixed signals. And and I want to be very clear, this is not any fault of or uh, misdiagnosis um, uh, on the part of the medical team or the medical doctors. Bladder can be very difficult to diagnose if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, but once we reached the point of diagnosis, um, there was this relief, right? This relief to know uh, what we were up against, you know, 
But that then meant we needed to get educated. We had to really learn about bladder cancer and and how we could as a, you know, as a, a family, um, as my grandmother's patient and and we as her caregivers and, and supporters, how we could overcome this. Learning about what the options were, all the while dealing with, you know, this whirling and swirling of emotions, this fear of cancer. Remember, I said my family is highly experienced with cancer because we come from Cancer Alley in Louisiana. And so, you know, there's all of these memories and emotions and relationships with people who have experienced cancer that shape how we viewed what was possible and not possible with cancer. But we needed to learn what was possible, what the options were for my grandmother, um, all the while confronting and and dealing with these emotions and these feelings. And it was admittedly very overwhelming for all of us, even though many of us had been cancer caregivers before, every cancer journey is different, even if it's the same cancer. So, you know, once we had treatment and recovery, uh, was happening. Then you had all of the checkups to monitor for cancer recurrence, any symptom, whether it was if my grandmother sneezed and she had a little urinary incontinence that came with that, um, if she possibly had blood in the urine, if she felt a twinge in her pelvis or her back, any symptom became something where we were like, is this a sign? What does this sign mean? And so consulting with her medical team. And so one of the things I want to emphasize from the start is it's vital to ask questions and learn as much as you can. You know, you're going to be on that emotional roller coaster, but what can help that is the more you learn and the more you understand, the more that you're going to be able to reduce that anxiety and all of the whirling and swirling of emotions that come with the cancer diagnosis and the cancer journey. And just to piggyback on that for a second, yes, the patient should ask questions, but also the doctors and the providers and the care team should ask questions too. It's not just how how are you doing with this treatment, but how is this impacting your life? How are you feeling from a diet standpoint? Are you sleeping? All of those other questions I think are important and we are doing a better job of incorporating that into our um, patient encounters. Thank you both so much for those responses. Um, so I'm talking about treatment. Let's uh, dive into that area next. So how may treatment of a urologic cancer like bladder cancer, for instance, um, affect a person's family, their work and their just way of life? Dr. Scarpato? Yeah, there are so many different ways that patients and their families can be impacted. And as you just heard, it really is an individual. So while there is a shared diagnosis, every individual is different. Every cancer journey is different. And there are different arenas that can be impacted. Uh, when you think about a patient's um, work, you know, cancer care and treatment for bladder cancer necessitates time away from work. You need to have frequent cystoscopies or looks in the bladder. There can be intravesical therapy, so medicines that are put into the bladder that require frequent interface with your urologist and the urology care team. And then side effects. The, the treatments can cause discomfort that either prevent you from doing your normal work or you need to take time off of work altogether. Um, so those types of uh, side effects shouldn't be um, shouldn't be forgotten. And then there's the psychological stress which can distract patients from from a job at hand. There are significant healthcare costs associated with cancer care really kind of across the, the spectrum of urologic cancers. And so that, and on top, on top of the diagnosis can add additional stress. We, we're learning so much more about financial toxicity. You're taking time away from work for the treatments that takes away from your 
um, earnings potentially. That stress and worry can impact relationships. It can take away from enjoyment uh, in activities that um, families once once shared in. So ultimately, families, I think, patients and caregivers get to what is considered kind of a, a new norm. And Dr. Bowles alluded to that a little bit before, but whether it's work, relationships, um, you know, activities outside of work, there's a there's a new norm that happens. Dr. Goltz, what is your view on this? When a loved one gets a urologic cancer diagnosis, you know, it can sometimes um, trigger or be the start of worry or even premature grieving, as was the case with my family. You know, there can be so many mixed feelings. There can be sadness. There can be anger, you know, before you really start to dive into that diagnosis. And, you know, because remember, when we come into cancer journey and it is highly individual, right? Um, we still bring into it all of everything we think we know or everything we've experienced related to cancer, what we've heard in the media, what we may have experienced previously as caregivers, or at least uh, significant others or neighbors or friends or coworkers of people who may have had cancer. And so depending on what our experiences uh, have been or where what our frame is, our schema, if you will, for how we understand or view cancer, we can come into this, you know, with all manner of emotions um, at the, the point of diagnosis. And with that emotional impact of cancer, you know, yes, it's great value to find the information. Um, it's an absolute must to have open and transparent and frequent conversations with the healthcare team to really understand what's happening. And for them to hear from you, um, uh, what is happening? Uh, because you may not know the significance of the symptoms you're experiencing. Uh, you may not know about resources that are available, uh, but keeping those lines of communication open are just vital to this journey. So in my life um, and with the experiences I had with my grandmother, this really helped me, even though I was already a professional social worker at the time to better handle the the feelings that I had um, and that I was having um, at the point that my grandmother was diagnosed and began her treatment. Um, you know, because as a clinician and as researcher, I'm reading the journal articles, I'm talking with professionals in my professional life, but that didn't necessarily speak to the unique journey my grandmother was on. You know, she was diagnosed with dementia actually not too long after her bladder cancer diagnosis. Um, and because with a lot of urologic cancers, um, the diagnosis may come at la later stages in life, at, at later ages, um, this is something that I want to highlight uh, because it can also have its own grieving and its own anger and sadness and emotions and journey that runs in parallel with the urologic cancer. And so, um, you know, when we talk about urologic cancer, it's really important to know developmentally where the patient is, because you also need to be communicating with the team about those pieces and getting uh, information and getting educated and also being able to address other health conditions or uh, cognitive uh, changes that may accompany or at least run in parallel with that diagnosis and that cancer journey. That was really great insight from both of you. Thank you. So what coping methods and self-care tips do you have for patients, caregivers, and their entire support team as they do go through the emotional highs and lows of living with the urologic cancer. Dr. Scarpato? Yeah, as we kind of have mentioned before, I really encourage patients to talk to friends and family, people that they trust and have 
relationships with and can kind of share in some of the sadness, some of the fear, some of the the wins. Um, and I say for most people, I do think that that is, is beneficial, but, but not for everyone. And some people feel that they don't want family and friends to worry about them and they would prefer to uh, communicate some of their experiences with other non-family and friend members, such as support groups, either locally or kind of nationally, among a community of people who are experiencing some of the same uh, emotions, and they can kind of support one another in that. And sometimes patients need more than just expressing their, their feelings. They need coping mechanisms from a trained professional. And so I encourage um, our patients who, who may need additional help beyond that to seek a counselor or a therapist who can offer some tips for managing some of these emotions and sometimes even medications um, that are necessary to get through a challenging time or a, a difficult uh, experience. And there, I would say there's no shame in that game, uh, talking to a professional and, and getting some additional advice on how to how to cope with something that's really challenging and really hard, I think is is only only beneficial. And you know, if if that's needed temporarily, great. If that's needed longer term, that's also great. Um, and then finally, I think being proactive. I, I think there's a lot with cancer that makes patients feel out of control. Like this is happening to them, and they are not feeling that there is much that they can do. So I try and encourage patients to be proactive and say, actually, there is a lot you can do and you want to be as healthy as you can. And that can involve following a healthy diet. And there are a number of uh, resources available. The Urology Care Foundation has a, a diet um, educational uh, pamphlet for patients about how to uh, choose, make healthy choices with diet. And there's, you know, exercise is super important. And I always tell my patients walking is exercise. You don't have to go to the gym or use an elliptical. You can just walk and that can be outside. I think there's something therapeutic and healing about being in the outdoors. So there's a lot that, that patients can do and talking to, to family and friends, talking to counselors and trying to live a healthy life are all tips that I routinely tell my patients. That's great advice. Thank you, Dr. Scarpato. Dr. Goltz, what advice do you have? Sure. I, I want to take a moment and just return to um, endorsing seeing a, a counselor or a therapist. I will say that as a therapist, um, you know, it's important for folks to to understand that um, just like you have tailored treatment related to your bladder cancer or other urologic cancer, you need tailored treatment related to counseling or therapy. Um, if you are seeking out a counselor or a therapist, um, looking at their credentials, looking at their experience, it could be very helpful to look for um, uh, professionals who have experience working with uh, individuals who have cancer or uh, working with cancer caregivers or families impacted by cancer. So just as there are um, medical professionals and healthcare professionals who specialize with cancer, there are also counselors and therapists who specialize in that way. Um, and so make sure that when you're looking that you're also screening uh, for their experience in that way, because then you've got a professional you can talk to who it at least has more than passing familiarity with the, the journey that folks with bladder or other urologic cancers may be on. Um, in my experience, you know, as a caregiver in particular, it was very helpful to open up channels of communication within our family. Often, um, especially uh, being in a Southern family, being in, um, you know, a, a Black and Creole family, there are secrets. And cancer is often a secret. And um, you don't just have to be Black or Creole for it to be a secret. Uh, but in my community, it's very much a secret. So opening up those channels of communication, uh, being clear and direct about how we could help 
what we could and couldn't do, the resources we would have uh, to bring to help care for my my grandmother and others um, when we needed a break for self-care and not being apologetic about that. Um, as caregivers, we are our own people. We've we have our own lives, um, and it's really of great value um, in in taking care of ourselves. And in fact, it's it's in vital importance uh, for us to be able to care for ourselves, so that we can give the best of ourselves in caring for our loved ones who are on their cancer journeys. And that coping um, and the self care that you know as part of that and supports that is different from for everyone. You know, finding things that you enjoy doing that help you relax, that help you better to regulate your emotions and organize your thoughts rather than putting them in a closet and locking the door tight and trying to ignore the feelings that you're having and the stress and the burnout. If you are, you know, doing healthy coping and you're doing positive uh, self-care, then that's going to make you more resilient. It's going to help you better regulate your emotions. It's going to help reduce your stress. It's going to help avoid burnout. And in turn, taking care of yourself helps make you a better caregiver. Self-care is not selfish. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Thank you. That was great advice from both of you. And I hope patients and caregivers and their support team, you know, try to implement some of those practices into their life because I I agree. I think it can really be really beneficial. So Dr. Scarpato, you had mentioned this a little bit earlier in the conversation, the financial impact mm-hmm. um, that a urologic cancer could have on patients and their families. So let's talk about the impacts of money on that emotional and mental health struggle and how support can be of value for these situations. Listen, I get stressed going to the grocery store now with the cost of eggs or bread or, you know, ice cream. It's really crazy. And money is a source of stress for all of us. And then you add on to that a scary diagnosis like cancer and the cost of the treatment, whether it's a surgery or a medication um, or, you know, something to manage the side effects of the surgery or the medications. And it can be really expensive all of a sudden. And we mentioned before kind of time away from work, which can impact finances. Hospitals are working on cost transparency and clinicians are trying to educate themselves kind of upfront on the cost of care so that we can tell our patients about that. Um, and we're collaborating more with Um, other organizations. So I think acknowledging it and knowing that the impact of cost can impact the um, patient journey, including cancer-specific outcomes, is important. I think acknowledging it and trying to come up with um, plans for success is where we are and a good place to be. Thank you. And Dr. Goltz, what do you have to say on this topic? You know, the the financial distress, the time away from work, the changing relationships, you know, that they have based on the cancer. So it's it's just crucial that patients and caregivers find support for the anxiety, often the depression, um, the, the questioning and second guessing of treatment decisions that can come from um, uh, the financial stress that's happening, uh, the the mental stress and strain uh, that then can happen around uh, finances throughout this journey. Uh, because believe me, people juggle, uh, they do mental calculus when they're looking at which bills to pay, whether they can pay their bills, whether they'll have um, groceries, what kinds of groceries? Is it cheaper to buy foods that aren't very nutritious, but will keep you full and fed? Um, or 
Are you going to buy those, you know, whole grains and fruits and vegetables that can really improve your health uh, throughout this journey uh, and give you all of the nutrients you need to shore up your mental health even, right? And so the more what we find ways to support and give resources in these areas, the better informed people will be and 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 hopefully they'll find the support they need. I always say, ask an oncology social worker. We're trained on national and local and regional resources um, in terms of not just assisting with um, support for utilities or rent or bills or transportation or lodging during treatment and surveillance. Um, but we we also are are very much trained to to look at other resources, how one might pay for mental health care, how one might connect folks with peer support groups or um, individual mentors uh, who who have been on this journey. And maybe they haven't been on the specific journey of that patient and caregiver or family, but they at least are knowledgeable and can be a source of support and um, and and uplifting and also uh, a, a safe place often uh, to to really kind of express things that you may not necessarily feel comfortable speaking with your family about or with your team about, but perhaps. Perhaps you could practice and in practicing, then bring those concerns and get the resources you need from your team or your family members. Thank you both so much. So what are some aspects that may not be talked about during a healthcare visit that you think may be useful for those on a urologic cancer journey? Dr. Scarpato? I just want to reiterate what I said before, that the patient is more than a diagnosis and I think it's easy for us to get in this trap of you have bladder cancer, here's what the guidelines say, here's what to expect with your treatment, here's when we'll follow up, and you focus on the management, which is we want to be experts in that, we want to make sure that the patient is aware of what's coming down the pike, but there are so many other aspects that we've talked about before, how patients can take back control, how patients can feel better through communication with different organizations or friend groups. One major point I'd like to make is that, you know, having cancer as an older person comes with a lot of challenges. You know, I mentioned my grandmother was diagnosed with dementia. That meant she needed more help taking medicines and and keeping track of her activities of daily living and so on. And so it can be very common for caregivers to need to take over uh, and serve as decision makers um, with during a cancer journey. And so, you know, I often suggest to caregivers, you know, especially those uh, of those patients who are older, that they start talking about end of life wishes and goals and care very early on, not as a scare tactic, not uh, to induce depression or anxiety, but actually to alleviate it later in the process. You know, to encourage um, our our loved ones, our patients, and I love what what Dr. Scarpato said, you know, but to give them control while they can still make legal decisions, make strong, competent choices, fully grasp the 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 consequences of those choices that they make them and communicate them to their caregivers, to their families, to their healthcare team early so that they can go and continue their journey feeling confident in the care that they're going to receive because they've contributed to the discussion, they've made the decisions, and it's been communicated to all of their caregivers. Thank you both. I think that was some really helpful information for patients and caregivers. And as we conclude this conversation, I would love for you to share any final thoughts you have on living with urologic cancer. Two, two final thoughts. One kind of speaks to this podcast. One of the reasons I love urologic cancer and caring for patients with urologic issues is the multidisciplinary aspect of it. You know, if you're someone with uh, urologic cancer like bladder cancer, 
you have a whole team behind you, a whole team rallying with you. And that's social work. That's your urologist. That's a medical oncologist. You know, that's the specialty pharmacy. Um, there are so many, um, so many important players all reviewing your care, taking care of you, thinking about different aspects that are important and adding, I think, to um, overall improve outcomes. So multidisciplinary care is crucial and, you know, you got a whole team behind you. And then two, I always like to say that there's cause for hope. I've learned so much in the past decade that I've been a practicing urologic oncologist about different disease states and about the other holistic aspects of patient care and how we can improve outcomes. And we're getting better every day. And the feedback from patients and the collaboration is all contributing to um, the hope that exists for patients with urologic cancers. And Dr. Galtz, what would you like to leave us with today? Communication and education are key. You know, I encourage others to ask questions, be prepared to advocate, uh, use your voice along with your loved one to get the resources, the medical equipment or the services that they're entitled to that are going to improve their quality of life, their outlook, their their sense of resilience um, and and really just um, partner with your medical team. And when you do those things, you really are creating the perfect conditions uh, in which that journey can go as smoothly and as positively and successfully as possible. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Scarpato and Dr. Gold, thank you both so much for this incredible conversation and for joining us on today's episode of the Urology Care Podcast. Funding for this podcast provided by Estellas and Pfizer Oncology. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, powered by trusted experts of the American Urological Association. For more information on today's topic and for all things urology health, visit urologyhealth.org. That's urologyhealth.org.